Hello everyone and welcome to the BioXL webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov and I will be today's host. As you know, Gromox is one of the most widely used applications for molecular dynamic simulations and for a long time there's been an interest in uh, developing an API for controlling and extending. Uh, luckily, we are already uh, have today Eric Ilgan from University of Virginia who will present his work on the development of this API. Before we start the main presentation, I have to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and a recording will be uh, posted on the BioXL website and on our YouTube channel where you can watch again later or you can share with your colleagues and friends. I'd like to give you a very brief overview of BioXL for those of you who uh, have not um, visited our webinars before. BioXL is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. It's a distributed consortium of 11 partners in Europe. We work in three main directions. One is on the development of three main codes used for molecular modeling simulations. These are Gromax, which you know very well, Haddock for docking and integrative modeling. Some of you might have used it for drug design, for example, and CPMD, where we work on hybrid QMMM simulations. Excel also develops different workflows and packages that improve the um, productivity mm -hmm. and efficiency of researchers. We also do a lot of training and pro we provide consultancy services to promote the best practices for the usage of these applications and the developed workflows. We, we are running a number of interest groups on different topics in the wide area of biomolecular research. Some of these interest groups might be of uh, particular interest to you. So we welcome you to join any of those that uh, are interesting for you. You can visit our uh, website. We have support forums. Uh, we share most of our code. We have a chat channel, so feel free to contact us. At the end of today's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So during the presentation now, you can use the control panel of GoToWebinar and you can type in your questions while the presentation is going. At the end of the talk, uh, I will uh, um, give you the microphone. I will let you speak to Eric directly and ask your questions. If you don't have functioning audio, I will read the question on your behalf. And uh, of course, after the webinar, you can always join us for discussion at ask.bioxcel.eu. With that, I'd like to present you Eric Irgan from University of Virginia, our speaker today. Eric completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Texas and he did a PhD in material science and engineering at the University of Michigan. After that, he joined Kassel Lab as a postdoctoral fellow and he's been working on the development of interfaces for uh, extensible molecular dynamic simulations. He is applying and is proponent of best practices for software engineering. And he is also supported uh, his current project by a, a fellowship by the Molecular uh, Science and Software Institute in the United States. So with that, I would like to welcome Eric and I will give him the opportunity to start the presentation. Hi, Eric. Hi, thanks. Yes, uh, I'm a postdoc under Peter Kassen at the University of Virginia, and I'm wanting to talk to you folks today about a project that was begun under um, an NIH grant in international collaboration um, with the University of Colorado and the University of Virginia and KTH in Stockholm uh, and 
that uh, continued under a molecular science software institute fellowship um, and I recognize uh, the names of a lot of the attendees here uh, I think we've got the, the right audience here um, but I I, I think uh, people have different ideas of of what they are looking for in an API for Gromax um, and uh, sometimes the the differences is uh, uh, people are thinking at, at rather different levels of access to Gromax. Um, my current project is addressing interaction with Gromax at uh, a few different levels that, that we're trying to keep discreet and, um, and I'll explain that more in a moment. Um, the uh, bio, I guess I gave a little bit of, of my background before the Kassen lab, but um, the, the group I'm in right now is uh, uh, focused on biomolecular sciences questions. Um, and as we all know, the, the most interesting and most useful topics are really hard. Um, uh, we are like many people working to combine experimental processes and data with uh, advanced computation techniques um, to try to tackle problems in infectious diseases. Uh, the Katzen lab is, is particularly focused on the biophysics of infection processes and we try to apply large scale simulation and uh, data processing and machine learning to try to apply and develop uh, new methods to tackle these tricky questions, um, as a lot of folks here probably are. Um, and like many labs over the years, we've uh, developed a lot of our own in-house software and in-house tools while also trying to uh, cobble together uh, community tools uh, with varying levels of compatibility, um, trying to both benefit from the community tools and, and contribute back to the community, but uh, we do end up, of course, with a lot of um, uh, modified source code in that, that's hard to maintain um, in different forked versions of, of Gromax, for instance. So uh, what we tried to do was to um, put some effort into um, some abstraction layers so that as our graduate students are developing their methods or their workflows, uh, they can do so without um, uh, producing a lot of stuff that's that's hard to maintain or hard to contribute and uh, so they can concentrate on the work that's most important to their research um, while we look for the right abstractions um, to maintainably interact with uh, other tools um, without sacrificing performance. Um, so what that looks like is uh, uh, we found some use cases that uh, together addressed uh, some research needs in our group while allowing us to explore um, uh, the beginnings of a toolkit to make easy to use scriptable um, Python interface to uh, complex Gromax based workflows, um, but to use Python as a front end to uh, to machinery uh, that interacts mostly at the C++ level and, and tries to use um, uh, integration with the, with the native Gromax code to avoid sacrificing performance. And uh, I feel like I hardly need to motivate the topic to this audience, but um, if you'll bear with me a moment, just looking back at the uh, past BioExcel webinars, I see other cases where people have um, uh, 
had to modify Gromax source code and then and then have a hard time trying to keep it maintained or keep it integrated. And other projects uh, trying to tackle the workflow issues. Um, sometimes these are integrated tasks and sometimes they're not. This uh, this talk from earlier this year particularly caught my attention. I, I, I think I remember during the Q and A, um, the the author had uh, described um, that the code extended Gromax, but um, but it sounded like there was some some trouble keeping it maintained. And uh, but there's a lot of great methods being implemented in this in this uh, sort of project, and other folks. Um, are concentrating on workflow management in, in various different ways. Um, there was a recent talk about common workflow language. Um, and uh, another project that um, is, is working to, to integrate different tools and, and try to help connect all these pieces. And so in short, uh, I'm trying to make Gromax more flexible and more free in a way uh, while keeping it fast. And um, a few of the sort of sample scenarios to set the stage, uh, the, the sort of pattern that, that I've been seeing over and over are, are a few different um, kind of general situations. Uh, there's uh, adaptive workflows, uh, for instance, I, I think can be, you know, maybe schematically represented something like this. You start with some sort of um, molecular dynamic setup, um, do some some simulation, um, then have to manage trajectories and uh, generate new inputs and launch additional simulations, um, which which ends up being a, a big management issue. Um, but if that's also coupled with complex analysis tasks, you can end up doing a lot of work that both to, both to shuffle data around and manage um, the tasks, but also to, to uh, try to integrate the analysis code with the simulation for performance reasons. Um, that can end up being a problem for uh, For the first research project that, that we applied ourselves to here, we um, we started with some work that had been done by a graduate student in our group that was, um, the, the work was based on uh, Gromax 2015 release, I believe. And um, it was getting harder and harder to continue to develop it and it wasn't getting any closer to something that we could really contribute back to the community. So uh, to describe that work a little bit. Um, we were working with uh, spectroscopists who had um, data describing the conformational ensemble. Uh, well, they're able to get uh, spectroscopic data describing um, a, a, an interesting part of the conformational ensemble of, of a biomolecule. And um, we wanted to understand um, the parts that couldn't be probed uh, experimentally. So um, we wanted to uh, uh, better better sample in, in simulation. Um, th th this is similar to to other problems that other people have tackled, but um, there wasn't at the time any um, any, anything integrated with Gromax to perform this restrained ensemble simulation. Um, so we look for a way to migrate that code. Um, just to flesh this out a little bit, the idea in, in this sort of a workflow is that uh, we have an experimental distribution of some measurable, in this case, it's the uh, pair distance between some spin labeled residues. We have the uh, experimental data for the, the, the part of the conformational ensemble that we're interested in. We start the simulation, use the uh, historical information of the simulation data, 
and the reference data from experiment and iteratively refine a bias potential that allows us, uh, that once it converges, um, allows us to focus on the interesting part of the conformational ensemble. So by the time we uh, finished this proof of concept, um, running a simulation of this sort uh, consisted of really just a, a handful of Python commands to drive it, um, plus some C++ code to implement the, the additional forces. And um, the, I, I've talked about performance a bit. One, uh, one of the key things is that the Python front end largely sets up a description of the work that's going to be performed and then allows the work to be dispatched altogether and um, uh, connect pieces that, that can all be implemented in, in C++, can connect them um, directly to each other and uh, flexibly dispatch the work to some other sort of scheduler. So what that ends up looking like is that um, with the first command here, um, you would start to describe this, this work graph uh, that includes a, an operation to, to open uh, some input file and attach that to um, a description of the, the molecular dynamics simulator. Um, and then the researcher uh, or, or someone who's exploring our sample code repository uh, can load a, uh, a module that's, that's uh, completely separate from Gromax. It's built against the Gromax installation, but it's uh, a separate chunk of code. Um, and the Python interface uh, allows to to get a, a Python handle um, to the code that implements this restraint, uh, attach it to the simulation, um, schematically at least, and then uh, once the workflow or, or the, the, the graph of interconnected computing components is fully described, then it can be dispatched to uh, to run. Um, and to, to the way this works, I mean, uh, I'm on the right side, I've just shown sort of schematically. The, um, the details of this are that the, the Python commands build up a, uh, a, a simple data structure that's easy to interpret um, into a directed acyclic graph of, uh, of operations and, and interdependencies. Um, and it's as simple as possible uh, because, uh, well, it's easier, <laughs> it's easier to separate the, the user interface and the implementation this way. Um, but also we hope that with it being as simple as possible, it can be very clearly described in, in a specification um, so that if someone uh, wants to use the computing infrastructure we've developed, but with a different front end tool, uh, it would be easy to write a connector. Or alternatively, if, uh, if the Python interface is helpful, but someone um, uh, wants to attach additional code, there's not a whole lot of parsing they need to do. And importantly, uh, we think of this as a, uh, as a, a middleware layer um, that makes it easier for us to um, to write connectors to uh, to different work dispatchers or, or other uh, either either workflow management software or resource management software um, that uh, perhaps some of you are already actively developing. Um, So the end result, again, uh, in our specific research case, is that uh, the researcher has has written 
some code that um, that can calculate the forces to be applied. And that's all it does is it, it takes atom positions as input, um, calculates a force according to the the uh, potential that that the researcher has expressed in a few lines of C++. Um, uses a, a couple of additional resources to allow an ensemble of simulations to uh, share their historical data, share their statistics, um, and collectively update the bias potential they're applying, and then to continue for another uh, simulation segment, and then to do this uh, repeatedly uh, until convergence. So um, out of the box, the, 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 the Python package that we've developed, um, uh, th this is the, the version from the manuscript um, and publication is uh, GMX API 0.0.4. <laughs> so um, uh, just out of the box, the basic functionality is, is uh, to be able to load um, uh, a single simulation or a batch of simulations and easily run it with uh, some additional options to configure the, the runtime environment as you would with, with MD run command line flags. Um, and we've intentionally tried to separate the, uh, this sort of uh, user interface and management stuff from, from um, implementations of any interesting methods. And, and for instance, the, the, uh, the cool part of the method that was developed um, is, is in a separate repository as, uh, as sample code. And the way, um, well, this is a, a simpler version of, uh, well, this is a simpler restraint just for illustration purposes. It's, uh, it's also in the repository, but it's just there um, for demonstration, really. And then this is just what it would look like to, to write a simple chunk of code that um, calculates a harmonic force between two particles that, that aren't necessarily um, uh, a short range non-bonded pair, but just uh, arbitrary pair of particles somewhere in the simulation. Um, which is uh, a facility that um, you know might not seem that interesting, but but we can build on it a lot, and uh, it's not something that's that was previously uh, in Gromax without without uh, uh, extending some pretty extensive and intricate infrastructure that um, that is in, in Gromax and, and would require branching the code, recompiling, and, and maybe be hard to maintain. So uh, the key points here are, um, again, you uh, sort of get a handle to, to the description of the simulation you want to run, starting with a uh, standard input file. Um, then get a handle to a custom chunk of external code, attach it to the simulation, and then run it. The current version is 0.0.6. Uh, it's available on GitHub right now. There's sort of three pieces. Uh, this URL goes straight to the Python package that is dependent currently on a forked copy of Gromax that, that is also linked there. We are working to, uh, to make that fork less and less necessary um, and, uh, and, and get uh, the primary distribution of Gromax caught up with, with the functionality that we've introduced because um, the, the, yeah, the whole intention here is, is that this would ultimately be completely um, part of the, the Gromax project. And uh, the official releases should 
work with their published functionality. Um, so we may have to keep forks active for a while to make the latest and greatest features available. Um, some of the things to call attention to in the current release of the Python package are uh, a completely CMake driven install that it should be easier than the, the package as published. Um, improvements to the sample code, which is in that third repository. Um, and in addition to uh, being able to run either uncoupled or loosely coupled ensembles of simulations that can reduce data collectively and, and update. Um, we've also added the ability for plugin code to, uh, to issue a stop signal to the simulation in which it, uh, the code is running um, for situations where uh, the, the plugin code is both, well, uh, may or may not be applying forces, but is uh, doing some sort of analysis on the fly and looking for some sort of convergence condition, for instance. So um, in that case, you wouldn't necessarily be running for a fixed number of time steps, um, but uh, stop upon achieving convergence. And the workflows that we're developing right now uh, use a mixture of, of these exploratory trajectory segments that run until some sort of convergence condition, um, refining parameters that are then used in, um, in other plugin code and launching branches of simulations with those discovered parameters. So, so we're working towards some, uh, we're, we're trying to enable some, some interesting workflows and uh, we're expecting GMX API 0.0.7 .0 to be based on uh, functionality in, in Chrome X 2019. Uh, we would like compatibility to the extent that, that simulations um, run from the MD run command line versus from the Python interface have exactly the same behavior because they're running on the same underlying code base and, and such. Um, so uh, what else is in the future? I mentioned both the, uh, I, I think a, a, a much requested feature to, to be able to um, stop an MD simulation from code implemented externally to Gromax. Uh, we are considering that to be one of, or, or, or a special case of, of a much broader set of uh, data flow sorts of features where the nodes in the work graph have um, distinct input data and output data uh, that can be bound from one node to another um, through the simple expression at the, at the Python level that's then captured in this um, intermediate data structure uh, so that all of the different C++ code can be properly bound um, when the work is dispatched. And to, to reiterate, the, the thing there is um, this sort of thing, pe people have been doing this sort of thing uh, for a while with, with Python wrappers or, or even shell scripts, um, trying to, uh, trying different ways to uh, collect output data and, and make it easily accessible as input data. Um, but what we're trying to do is, uh, is to allow that to be abstractly represented in, in Python or uh, in an in intermediate uh, middleware API uh, while allowing for an implementation that doesn't necessarily rely on the file system, doesn't rely on uh, simulations totally tearing down and starting up again, um, not just within the same HPC job, for instance, but even within the same uh, 
the same process. Um, I, I mean, like CPU process uh, without tearing down the MPI environment and such. Uh, so how how does how does this uh, how does this look? How, I, I want to spend a moment, I guess, uh, talking about the lower level API and implementation um, because some folks are are going to be particularly interested in in how the plugins work and such. Um, we we've provided this Python package uh, that uses PyBind 11 for, for Python bindings, but our goal is not to uh, insist that, um, that anyone should have to derive from our Python classes or depend on our Python module in order to interact with this API. And plenty of people already have great Python interfaces that they're happy with. Um, they've, they've, and, and, and maybe implemented bindings with some other package like Swig or, um, or maybe even directly with the C API for, for, for Python. So, um, so we try to make sure that the, uh, the bindings, uh, protocols for, uh, for the C++ objects that, that, that researchers write. Um, and for the, the C++ interface in Gromax, um, so that that's simply and clearly specified so that anyone can implement um, bindings however they want, and they're free to either use the Python package that we provided to glue everything together or, or implement their own stuff. So, uh, so this is just uh, an, an example of, of how it's implemented in our package, um, and if you've got your own uh, preferred method of Python bindings. Hopefully, uh, it's as simple to do your favorite way without uh, any dependencies you don't want. Um, so this this would be this is a chunk of code that's out of the the Python package. This is the corresponding chunk of code out of the uh, the sample code that we provided in our our sample restraint repository. Um, and and what this does is just declare the the Python side um, of of the, uh, the the simulation and the plugin code uh, so that uh, Python can uh, tell the the compiled code or the compiled objects about each other and and get them speaking to each other uh, through the C++ interface and once that's done um, yeah, so the 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 Python C uh, the Python C API is uh, used to start with the uh, with the Python API, um, let that turn into a C plus uh, plus conversation, um, and then the the uh, the C plus plus objects know about each other and can sit there and wait for uh, the later API call that tells the simulation to start. And um, a researcher doesn't need to worry about that necessarily. That that's more information for someone who's who's already got a um, or who's thinking about how their package with Python bindings might interact with ours. But it also, I think, illustrates uh, to some degree um, how we've tried to separate um, uh, code development responsibilities. Um, in the way we think is appropriate. The, a, uh, a, a researcher doesn't have to think much about how their plugin um, gets its Python bindings or, or how it talks to uh, libgromax. Uh, instead, if someone wants to, uh, to implement their own plugin, like the, uh, um, uh, the restrained ensemble plugin, for instance, the, the main thing they have to do is just implement a calculation function with with one of the documented call signatures. Um, at this point, there's there's a little more boilerplate to copy and paste than I would like, um, but it really is just boilerplate. It's not um, a, a whole lot of custom code, and we're working uh, 
uh, such that in in future simulations there's less and less of that excuse me in, in future versions there's less and less of that boilerplate um, more stuff moved to to headers that are in the uh, the the upstream packages like Romex rather than um, rather than in the in the sample code or or uh, the the researchers code base um, and to use uh, more templating and such so that when uh, Gromax or other packages are updated um, the the researcher may have to recompile their code but uh, the uh, any any API changes that were unavoidable um, are, are hidden they just uh, get dealt with by the headers I mean yeah by the template headers so I think there's going to be a lot of time for for questions um, but to yeah just to, to recap a bit we um, we were I guess uh, yeah, we, we've built a collaboration with the goal of um, providing different sorts of API access for people with with uh, various API needs. We, we found a, a research question that that uh, required as many of those use cases as <laughs> as as we could find to to make a um, uh, sort of a sample implementation and, and give us an excuse to develop the the most core features, which uh, we uh, released as GMX API 0.0.4 in in March, and um, the uh, a bioinformatics applications note is in uh, early access publication now, uh, waiting for uh, waiting for an actual issue to appear in, um, and that was co-authored between. Or by by me and uh, Jennifer Hayes, a graduate student in our lab, and Peter Casson. Um, the project, uh, the the biggest part of the project, was started under a National Institute of Health grant um, that established a collaboration between Pascal Mertz and Michael Schertz at the University of Colorado Boulder um, and uh, Peter Kasson's group in, in Virginia and um, KTH, uh, the, the Gromax team over at KTH in Stockholm, of which Mark Abraham has, has been um, my close contact and collaborator. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Jessica Nash, at, uh, who's, who's my counterpart through the uh, at at the molecular software, the molecular sciences software institute, who's um, uh, been a, a great resource, uh, along with the other resources that that I've had as a result of this fellowship. The GitHub URL, uh, like I said, there's three repositories, but you should be able to find them all through the through the, the, the main entry point there. And um, yeah, we, we hope that this project is, uh, is of some immediate use to you, but also clarifies some of the, the directions in which we're expending our energy and um, the sorts of functionality that we hope will be more natively accessible um, in official Gromax releases in the future. So uh, before I say any more, I suppose I should find out what it is that you folks are most interested in. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, this is awesome again. So uh, it's a very uh, great software we're looking forward to start trying it. We have a question from um, Ananta Kumar. Let's see if we can get an audio. Hi, can you hear us?
Hello, Takwa. Could you uh, say first? Hello. Hi. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Which algorithm is used for this simulation here? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Which algorithm is used for the simulations? Different uh, algorithms are used, right, for simulation. For particularly Lomas care, it's which algorithm is used? Any the, specific algorithm? Uh, the 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 manuscripts and the uh, the figures I showed are uh, from an implementation of an algorithm based on that of Benoit Roux. Um, that it was simply called the restrained ensemble method. Um, and it's more completely described um, in, in the work by Jen yeah. Jennifer Hayes is the and migrant who, um, who adapted that for, for Gromax for her research. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I was wondering if if users start trying out the the code and play with it, uh, what's the best place to to find help if they have questions? Will it be through GitHub or um, um, support forum? What's the, the way to communicate I, with early users? Uh, or send a private mail. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to send uh, a private mail. I, I, I'm uh, but uh, I think the the issue tracking system on GitHub is um, I'm I'm uh, pretty on top of that I think so anyone's welcome to file an issue and I'm totally open to suggestions if other uh, communication channels group you know that doesn't seem preferable um, as this as we move towards more integration with Romax. Um, I expect uh, conversation will, will probably move in the direction of the Gromax mailing list and the Gromax issue tracking system. But, but right now, um, yeah, either the issue tracking system on on GitHub or totally fine. Um, and uh, the, the there is documentation um, that is well. There, there's documentation you can build in the project that's also built and. Uh, links to read the docs.org um, and and again a, a lot of the interesting stuff that that we're trying to enable with the with GMX API has sample implementations in that separate sample restraint repository that's, that's linked from the main repository and that repository in turn has uh, some sample scripts some sample Jupyter notebooks um, uh, and, and documentation in the code itself, as well as uh, there should be links to um, Docker images if if you just want to get something going quickly and just kind of poke around uh, and and try the examples or or see what it looks like. Thank you. Uh... We have uh, another question from Ludovic's Othin. Let's see if we can get a audio connection. Mm -hmm. I guess his audio is not working. So the question is, are there any plans to build visual workflow on top of GMX API? Um, I, my, uh, my personal interest is in uh, both object-oriented Python API and in uh, nice, simple uh, procedural Python interface built on top of that. But like I said, um, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for, for, uh, to integrate with whatever other efforts uh, people want to make at at any uh, at any level, whether it's a uh, high level interface or, or some part of the implementation. And trying to make the uh, work with that. Um, I, I'm not aware of any 
uh, visual workflow tools that that I, I've uh, had a chance to target in particular yet, but there's there's definitely um, uh, if someone has a, a favorite workflow manager or, or something like that, um, then then I would love to to try to make it as easy as possible to uh, to integrate and and leverage the efforts of the different projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's big opportunities in that space for uh, extending to. Yeah, I, I guess to expand on that, if I could extend on that just for a moment, I think um, uh, in the past BioXL webinars, people have presented projects that, uh, that do a great job um, and, and really thoroughly go into sort of one level of interaction. With uh, with the molecular simulation workflow, and um, and there's there it's, it, it may be that there's one level that, that that project is particularly excited about or particularly good at compared to other projects, but it seems like everyone is forced to deal with more layers of the software stack than um, than maybe is is productive. Um, so so I think uh, the the, the biggest thing that um, that we might accomplish in the context of those other projects would be to make it easier to uh, to apply those those uh, more general packages uh, to 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 Gromax uh, without having to wrap the command line or work with a branch of Gromax and uh, to still get native performance without spending a whole lot of time working just on integrating some package with Gromax instead of um, the, the higher level methods or, or advanced workflows that the, that the projects are really focused on. And so we have the, uh, we, I, I think we can provide a good Python interface at several levels uh, to that functionality that we make access to. Um, and I hope it's useful to people, but uh, uh, like I've said, I, I definitely don't want to compel people to use the interface if they have a better one in mind or, or, or one that suits their purposes more. Um, and yet, if uh, if there's a chance to to use both the Python interface aspects that we've provided as well as uh, Python interface for a package to be integrated, then then that would be that's great too. We're, we're trying to make the um, the interoperation um, between different sorts of bindings as, as easy as possible, and the data exchange as high performance and easy as possible. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question from Adam. Can you hear us, Adam? Hi, yes, uh, thanks, Rossen. Um, so my question uh, is a, a, a general one. It's about the extent or, or how your code interfaces with the underlying Gromax software. And it seems that there's a fairly tight integration here. Do you think in the future, as the Gromax source code changes, it's likely that there will be uh, updates required to keep this this API in sync um, because it's not just about sort of building a command line or or building a parameter file and then running the program I, it seems to be deeper than that is that correct uh, yeah yes yeah, so exactly so um, I, I mean that's the the problem we're trying to, to solve essentially is um, you know, we're not the first people to 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 make a, a Python interface that lets you steer a Gromax simulation. But in conjunction with uh, developing this Python package, um, we are, are working specifically with the Gromax project to, to develop uh, the appropriate um, Gromax level C++ API um, that we can uh, build on and 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 try to 
use uh, try to get um, the the necessary infrastructure into the the core Gromax installation. So um, my goal for the the coming year is that um, uh, well we're we're in the process of of uh, of integrating some of the Gromax infrastructure that we've developed with the idea that that you would be able to uh, install Gromax and then install the Python package and if uh, you then upgrade Gromax at at most you have to recompile the Python package and moving forward uh, ultimately um, the idea would be to have the most basic uh, sample bindings uh, in the Gromax core project so that um, uh, yes yeah, so, so that it's it's always in sync and, um, and and we're trying to do you know move as much of the implementation as possible down to the C++ level C++ level so that the it's it's uh, infrastructure that's shared uh, with the command line tools and the other parts of the Gromax project and, and not I mean, the, the maintenance the maintenance nightmare is is uh, is what we're trying to avoid and trying to tackle and then like you say that there's there's the other part um, uh, the the plugin code definitely operates at uh, at different levels there's um, uh, there's the Python side which which for plugin um, we want to basically provide uh, some tools so that the, the Python uh, interface is basically generated for the researcher and they just work on the C++ side but the uh, the C++ code we're um, we're both introducing uh, abstractions between the the MD uh, the, the computation that supports the molecular dynamic simulation um, so that it's um, you know if, if you have if you have a, a task that's as simple as as calculating uh, a force based on a vector then then that doesn't inherently depend on any details of, of Gromax so um, so where we can we are are trying to uh, abstract out these these different types of, of calculations so that um, we can put the most uh, stable API on the Gromax core, and to the extent that uh, that that there's instability there, we can also provide adapters, um, probably in the form of, of template headers. So worst case scenario. Uh, the researcher would just recompile the same plugin that they've already written against the new copy of Gromax, and uh, and with the updated template headers, it would just recompile and, and work with the new version. Um, you know, the, the compatibility will will improve over time, but already um, we were able to migrate uh, code that was tightly coupled to Gromax 2015 into something that uh, has no appearances of being coupled to any particular Gromax version. And, uh, and it then uh, and eliminated a lot of the lines of code. Um, this is for that, that restrained ensemble potential that I mentioned. Um, and in, in fact, right now, um, it, uh, it's not built against the most current version of Gromax, but um, as we uh, continue to migrate that infrastructure and get things updated, the, uh, I don't think the I don't think the researcher's code is going to change really. I think it's basically going to be um, install the new version and recompile, and that's it. Great, thank you. Thank you, and we have uh, another question from Ludovic. Does uh, GMX API provide any utilities or helpers to prepare input topologies? Uh, he's specifically interested in setting up large simulations, like for instance, the HIV cap site with NAMDT and even larger systems. That's a great question, and I I, uh, <laughs> I I wish the answer were yes, absolutely. Um, we uh, with 
the 0.0.7 release and, and upcoming work for the rest of this fall, we're going to be spending a lot more, or I'm, I'm going to be spending a lot more attention to, um, to input preparation. Um, but at, at the moment, you still have to use other tools to, to set up the simulation. Um, because we want to be able to uh, better help people run adaptive workflows and stuff, it's, um, it's, it's actually pretty essential um, that we uh, have more, um, more, more public, easy to use, stable tools to, to manipulate inputs and generate um, new simulations. So, so the same code that's being developed to connect different parts of, of, uh, of a simulate, analyze, simulate, analyze type of workflow or an adaptive workflow, those same tools um, can be used just for general simulation preparation. Um, but uh, no, it's not in G GMX API yet. Um, there are people who are working on such tools um, with an awareness of the possibility to integrate soon with GMX API. So I, I, I hope that we see more of that this fall, but right now um, you have to rely on other tools. Thank you, Eric. Uh, these were all the questions we had until now. So before we finish, can we go to the next slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to tell all of our audience that we have two more webinars coming up uh, in the next uh, few weeks. So on the 4th of October, we will have Mark Baden, who will show us some pretty cool way of uh, 3D visualization of biomolecular structures. Um, so you're welcome to come in and enjoy the presentation. Uh, and a week after that, uh, we have Kathleen Bannon, who will present us the Smirno format, uh, which is part of the Open Force Field Initiative, uh, a new take on uh, helping the joint efforts of the, all these different disparate uh, formats that are being used for molecular structures. So everybody is welcome to join us for this. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. And uh, thank you, Eric, for the great talk. We are looking forward to further developments of GMX API. And uh, we will have another presentation in the near future. Yeah, Yeah. Okay, thank you all, and that's all for today. Bye. Bye-bye.